Well, good morning and welcome to this, the second instalment of our reading through John James Taylor's account of his visits to Transylvania in 1868 to attend the 300th anniversary of the celebration surrounding the Edict of Torda. So, I should perhaps say at the outset that um, John James Taylor uses names a slightly different way than the way we would today, but it's usually clear uh, who he means. He also frequently gives the German names for places. So, for instance, he, he calls uh, Kolschwar or Cluj uh, Klausenberg throughout his text. But hopefully these things uh, will be clear as we go through. So we'll carry on with our story of John James Taylor's travels. It is difficult to describe the singular impression produced by finding oneself among a people whose political sentiments and religious beliefs so closely resemble our own, but whose language is so entirely novel and strange, whose traditions carry them back to some unexplored depth of Central Asia, and whose features bear to this day a marked Oriental type. In spite of this difference of origin, the institutions and the manners of the Magyar race have a remarkable similarity to those of England, and for England they entertain a reverential regard. Their ancient institutions, though resting on a basis essentially aristocratic, are instinct with the same spirit of manly freedom which inspired our own barons when they wrung Magna Carta from John. The Bulla Aurea which among other remarkable articles contains a provision against arbitrary imprisonment by the Crown and authorises armed resistance to its encroachments, secured the personal liberties of the whole body of their nobles or freemen as early as the beginning of the 13th century, only seven years later than the famous meeting at Runnymede. With the growth of the true spirit of liberty, their patriotic nobles are renouncing their exclusive privileges. The invidious distinction of races is legally abolished. The peasantry are emancipated from subjection to the lords of the soil and relieved from exclusive taxation. The equality of all religions before the law is being proclaimed and the release of commerce from its old bonds will be among the certain results of achieved and consummated independence. In the manners of the Hungarians there is a certain air of reserve and latent hauteur which is thoroughly English and the unmistakable indication of self-reliance and determination. Judging from those with whom I had the opportunity of conversing, I should say the predominant tone of political sentiment was strong constitutionalism, equally remote from American republicanism and French imperialism something corresponding to the more liberal and advanced type of English Whiggism, with revived and ardent loyalty since the recent change in Austrian policy to the person of the sovereign as King of Hungary, not as Emperor of Austria, with whom as such they profess to have no political relations. Unitarianism, our Transylvanian friends think, had probably an origin in their country independent of the influence of Blandrata. Blandrata was in every sense a bad man, whom no one would like to regard as the founder of any Christian church. His history is so well known that I need not repeat it here. Francis Davidis, whom he so treacherously betrayed and ruined, was an eloquent and learned preacher in Klausenburg, who had already passed through the preliminary stages of Lutheranism and Calvinism. The Unitarian question had already been discussed in Hungary proper, where it excited great interest. It was a disputation conducted by Blandrata and Davidis at Alba Iulia, the modern Stuhl Weissenberg, against the Orthodox, which made such an impression on the mind of the young sovereign of Transylvania, John Sigismund that he embraced Unitarian views 
and was induced to issue the proclamation of general religious freedom at Torda in 1568. Some remarkable men appear to have agreed with Davidis as to the impropriety of praying and offering divine homage to Christ, regarding it in the same idolatrous light as the worship of the Virgin and the saints. Among these were Somerus and James Paleologus, successively rectors of the gymnasium at Clausenburg. The latter was a Greek from Chios of the imperial line at Constantinople. He was burnt at Rome for his opinions in 1585. Blandrata was said at first to entertain the same views, and he had united with Davidis in inviting Somerus from Germany to Clausenburg. It's interesting to remark that in the earliest notices we meet with of the Unitarian Church at Clausenburg, it is constantly associated with the gymnasium, as if one of the main objects of its founders had been to secure the continuance of sound learning as indispensable to the growth of religious knowledge and the safety of religious freedom. The influence of the humanists of those days is distinctly perceptible in all these movements. It is supposed, therefore, not without good grounds, that influences must have been already working strongly in the popular mind in favour of simple Unitarianism, which the following circumstance is said to have brought all at once to a head. The people were assembled in the marketplace, all alive to the exciting questions, which in that age kept men's minds in a perpetual ferment, when Davidis suddenly mounting one of those curious rounded boulders which may still be seen scattered over the face of the country, addressed the multitude with such earnestness and persuasiveness on behalf of the Unitarian views which he had himself embraced, that they hailed his sentiments with acclamation, and raising their pastor to their shoulders, rushed with him into the adjoining church, which had hitherto been Catholic, but of which the Unitarians henceforth kept possession till 1718. On what authority this story rests, whether it is contained in any written document of the time or is simply a local tradition, I do not know. It was narrated to me as a fact, of which there was no doubt, by some of the present Unitarian ministers of Clausenberg, when I was shown the boulder from which Davidus is said to have preached. Nor does it appear to me in any way incredible. The boulder itself has passed through several migrations. It was removed from its original site in the marketplace to the house of a Unitarian gentleman outside the walls, and thence it has been brought to one of the side doors of the Unitarian church where I saw it, and where it is proposed to have a, an inscription graven on it, recording the tradition of which it is the subject. Davidis, I need hardly say to the readers of this review, differed from the Polish Unitarians or Socinians in carrying out to its legitimate consequences the doctrine of the simple humanity of Jesus Christ, and denying that religious worship could be properly rendered to a human being. For this logical consistency, he incurred the malignant hostility and persecution of Blandrata, in which, unfortunately for his own reputation, Faustus Socinus, indirectly at least, joined. Davidis was suspended from his ministerial functions and died in confinement. A great reaction followed. Out of 250 ministers, only 16 or 18 stood firm by the principles of Davidis and refused to subscribe the formula introduced by the influence of the Polish brethren through Blandrata and Faustus Socinus. This is a dark page in the history of Unitarianism, which one would gladly, if possible, erase, but which serves to show that the spirit of persecution, when motive and opportunity occur for indulging it, is not confined to any form of doctrinal belief. By the present generation of Unitarians in Clausenberg, Davidus's name is held in profound veneration. They look up to him as the real founder of their church. His works, both in Latin and in Hungarian, which are becoming rare, are hunted up with great eagerness 
and are said by those who have studied them to contain some very advanced views, quite in anticipation of the present day. For myself, I am only acquainted with his replies to Blandrata, which are necessarily limited in object. He has, however, in these replies, effectually repelled the charge of Judaizing and Mohammedanizing brought against him by his accusers. No one who reads what he has written can doubt the depth and sincerity of his Christian faith, whatever they may think occasionally of the soundness of his scriptural exegesis. He has argued also most powerfully and conclusively against the duality of divine persons. Mr Alexander Yakab, brother of the Mr Yakab who visited England several years ago, and whom some may perhaps recollect as present at the laying of the foundation stone of Hope Street Church in Liverpool, is a great collector of rare old Unitarian books, of which his library in Clausenburg possesses a considerable number. Out of this collection, he very kindly presented me with an exegetical work of Davidis on the Bible, printed in a clear, firm type at Clausenburg in 1571 which he described as Liber Rarissimus, and which, from its being written in Magyar, I regret I am unable to use. Well, we'll leave our reading here for the time being, and continue again tomorrow. Thank you for listening.